Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Patent Literacy Symposium. This session is entitled Comprehension is an Outcome, Not a Strategy. My name is Jeannie Hertzler, and I am excited to facilitate this second concurrent session for everyone. I have a few housekeeping items that you probably heard in the first session, but we're going to repeat them so you have all the information. Uh, if you're looking for handouts for this session, you can find them on the Schoology platform. The session handouts are within the folder for today, June 10th, in this time slot for the session and under the name of this session. This session will be 75 minutes long, so we'll try to end around 2.30. We're going to ask that you please um, mute your video feature. So if you can turn your video off and stay muted throughout the meeting, that will eliminate any potential distractions to the presentation. So we will give you some time to do that. Um, we also want you to know that the chat feature will be off between the participants. So you won't be able to chat with one another, but you can chat with me. And um, that's how we'll be able to um, answer your questions and also how we will handle the content related questions uh, for this session because Dr. Archer has a, requested that we use the last five minutes for questions. Um, you can just enter those content related questions into the chat feature and then we'll select as many as we can before the session is over in that last five minutes to be addressed. Remember, we're asking everybody to tweet or share on social media that what you're learning from the symposium and uh, we did this session last, last concurrent session and it was awesome. So you're going to have a great time today. So if you wanna uh, tweet out or use the hashtag PA Lit Symposium 2020, we would love for you to do that. So now I'm going to introduce you to our esteemed presenter, Dr. Anita Archer. Dr. Archer serves as an educational consultant to state departments, county agencies and school districts on explicit instruction and literacy instruction. She has taught elementary and middle school students and is the recipient of 10 outstanding educator awards. Dr. Archer has served on the faculties of San Diego State University, the University of Washington, and the University of Oregon. She is internationally known for her presentations and publications on instructional procedures and literacy instruction and has co-authored numerous uh, curriculum materials with Dr. Mary Gleason, including the rewards program for reading and writing intervention. Dr. Archer authored with Dr. Charles Hughes, Explicit Instruction, Effective and Efficient Teaching. Dr. Archer, thank you so much for being with thank us you. today. We've already had a delightful morning. We have. Uh, and I've come to you from Portland, Oregon. So uh, this morning, my first session, uh, I had to be online at seven in the morning. So, uh, but you have I had a very warm day in, Pens uh, in Pennsylvania, and I am experiencing about 65 degrees and overcast in Portland, Oregon. So one of the most critical questions that I'm asked again and again uh, whether it's elementary, middle school, or even high school, is what strategy, the one strategy that would be the magic pill to improve comprehension? Well, as the title uh, infers, comprehension is an outcome, not a strategy. So we're going to learn what students need to have in order to have comprehension of text that they read. Uh, so uh, looking at this uh, I'm Anita Archer, and this is the book that I wrote with Charles Hughes, uh, who is uh, from your lovely state, uh, and Explicit Instruction, Effective and Efficient Teaching. And uh, I put a website here that we have little videos that are vignettes, uh, so you could look at uh, explicit instruction being taught, as well as literacy lessons, very short ones that might be helpful. Uh, and so, I already know the quality of teachers and administrators in Pennsylvania, having had the great opportunity to be there many times. So in this presentation, I have three goals. Number one, to affirm what you already know and already do, because you're gonna say, ooh, I always do that, I know that, uh, and that would be very useful. Number two, 
sometimes, if we've taught many years, this would be my 54th year of teaching, uh, some things can drop out of our repertoire and we need to resurrect it and bring it back in. Uh, and so uh, it will be there to remind you. And then I wanna expand your knowledge too and give you some tools that you could use at your school site. All right, so um, in preparation for this, I had read many, many, many studies and books around comprehension. And it was interesting because pretty much comprehension was defined similarly across different resources. Um, an act of understanding what you've read, extracting meaning from what you've read, the understanding and interpretation of what you read, making sense of what you read. So uh, we have an idea of what comprehension is, but it truly is an outcome, not a strategy. And what does the students need to know and be able to do in order to have the outcome of being able to understand what they've read? Well, number one, uh, they have to be able to read the words accurately and fluently. They need to thus have all of the word level instruction so that they can read accurately unfamiliar words, uh, instantly recognize familiar words, uh, and thus have fluency. So if they are automatic in reading the words, then they can take their cognitive energy and put it on comprehension. But that's not enough. They also have to understand the meaning of the words. They have to have vocabulary, particularly the seminal words uh, in the passage that are absolutely necessary. But that's not enough either. They also need to have an adequate amount of background knowledge. And finally, they need to be able to hone their attention on the most critical content. So comprehension is an outcome. Uh, if I can read the words accurately and fluently, if I have vocabulary, if I have adequate background knowledge, and I'm able to attend to, concentrate on, uh, sort through what I'm reading, then I will have uh, comprehension. So uh, we're gonna look at each of these and also look at what we could do at our school site that would make a difference. So let us start with the first thing, the students need to be able to read the words accurately and fluently. And there are definitely students that we might work with whose problem in comprehension is they simply can't read the words both accurately and fluently. Uh, and uh, when we look at that variable, uh, one, these are quotes from a book you just heard for the introduction. Uh, I'm certain that you heard Louisa Motes. Uh, and she has an excellent chapter uh, in a book that is uh, a series of chapters by very prominent researchers uh, that is edited by David Kilpatrick and an, a group of his colleagues. And starts with this. I'm going to read uh, and you're going to touch the words and follow along. Cognitive science has shown beyond a doubt that fluent Accurate word recognition is a hallmark of skilled reading with comprehension. Uh, and so we have many studies that support that. If you can read the words, you have a skill necessary for comprehension. Now, it makes easy sense. If I can't read the words, uh, I don't have an inroad into comprehension. And she goes on to say, and that poor readers are most always limited by their inability to use letter sound skills, phonic skills, to identify unfamiliar words. And so that when we look at our poorest readers, uh, one of the major challenges they have in accessing understanding is that they cannot use the foundational decoding skills to access the pronunciation of unfamiliar words. And goes on. And consequently, to establish a sight voca recognition vocabulary sufficient for fluent reading. And so you have almost every word that you instantly recognize. Uh, and so as you're reading, you can put all of your cognitive energy on comprehension, not on decoding unfamiliar words. So there is the reference. Be certain that if you're, particularly if you are a literacy nerd, and I think many of you are, 
This is a must read. Uh, excellent chapters, yes, by uh, Louisa Motes. Uh, excellent chapters by Margaret McCoon and Isabel Beck. Uh, by Lene Airy, excellent, uh, by Oak Hill, uh, David Kilpatrick, it's a must read. Uh, so here is the first of the checklists for schools uh, based on we want to improve comprehension, how should we examine what we're doing uh, over time to make a difference? Well, number one, you want to teach those foundation skills to all students to mastery. We can't just hope that they're going to gain the foundation skills. Uh, even prayer may not be enough. Uh, we're going to have to teach them. And so many of the sessions at this excellent symposium are looking at the different areas so that you have print skills, that you are able to name the letters and you know things, simple things like top to bottom, left to right. And you have phonemic awareness. Uh, so be my students, all say the sounds and you say the word, all say the sounds and you say the word, man, what word, man, excellent, uh, and put up a hand and put up one finger for each sound in man, first sound, mm. next sound, ah, next sound, mm. and the word is man. So you have two critical skills. Uh, you have blending and you have segmenting. Uh, but if you read particularly some of the writing of Kilpatrick, um, he reminds us that the students might need automaticity even beyond that in phonemic awareness. Uh, and so advanced phonemic awareness where you delete or you add sounds or you exchange sounds. Uh, so just be my students for a moment. Our word is Pam, what word? Pam. Take away the p and the word is ab. All right, so we could delete sounds. And then of course, students need letter sound associations. I mean, that's the alphabetic principle in English that those letters represent phonemes, sounds. And so obviously the students need to learn the letter sound associations systematically very systematically, not just by a hope and a prayer, but this one's introduced and practiced and put into words. This one's introduced and practiced and put into words. And then the students need to be taught decoding, decoding of single syllable words, uh, and then later multisyllabic words with prefixes and suffixes. About 80% of words that are two syllables or more have a prefix or a suffix. So that would be essential. And they need sight words. So there's a term that has confused many people because they just think of high frequency words as sight words. But actually any word that you have been exposed to and practiced should be recognized automatically, whether it's regular or irregular, high frequency or low frequency. For you, uh, almost all words are sight words. And sight words, the automatic recognition of words leads to fluency. So all children need to be taught this very systematically. Uh, and they also need to be taught not just single syllable words, but multisyllabic words. And uh, in intervention, if we have like third, fourth, or fifth graders who still read below the second grade level, they're going to need to be taught very systematically with very good curriculum, these same foundation skills. And the thing that I see often left out is if I wanted students to read a passage with comprehension, there might be some words in there that I need to pre-teach the pronunciation for and reinforcing all of the decoding skills we have taught. So let's just look at what that one would look like. So uh, one day I was working in second grade and they said, we would like you uh, to teach this passage. Uh, and so I read the story and uh, as I did it, I marked places I might stop and ask text dependent questions to firm up their comprehension. So that's what those numbers are on my own copy. But then I also asked myself, how can I increase 
of the student's accuracy uh, and fluency in terms of word reading for this passage. So I actually went through it and pulled out the words that I wanted to teach. And this came from the day I taught that. Now, one of the things I've been doing a great deal of is training teachers on how to do remote teaching where you have the students live, but also when you have recorded lessons. So I'm gonna teach a bunch of this as I would do it with students from my class, because you never know, uh, there may be another time, another wave that leads us to remote teaching. So be my students, my second graders. So we are going to read a story and at the top of this page is the title. I want you to put your finger under the words and say each of the words to yourself. And read the words with me and begin. Little Bear Lost. See, I'm already curious. Is this going to be about a bear? Or is it going to be about a boy who uh, is named Little Bear? And how did he get lost? So I'm already thinking about the story. And here are some words that are in our passage that we are going to need to be familiar with. And so looking at the first column, and you see the loops underneath it, and we've done this before, I'm going to uh, read the parts and then we'll read them together. X plane, okay? And put your finger at the beginning of the word and move it under the loops. And first part, X, next part, plane, and say the whole word, explain. So when I tell you how to do something uh, or I tell you about what happened, I explain. Looking at the next word uh, and listen as I read the parts, explained. And say the parts, explained. And the whole word is explained. Now one of the reasons I chose this is of course it's written in past tense. But one of the errors in the group I was teaching were predominantly English language learners. Uh, and one of the most common errors is the pronunciation of ED at the end of words. But by pre-teaching this, I'm increasing the probability that they will be able to read the passage more accurately and fluently. Of course, I'm giving very systematic decoding instruction in addition to preparation for the passage. Well, what else do the students need? Uh, it's not just that they can read the words accurately and fluently, but they have to understand the meaning of the words. They have to have vocabulary. Uh, and, you know, consistently I am finding that we need more emphasis on vocabulary. So let's look at uh, what we might do and why. First, you know this, Vocabulary is related to reading comprehension. So in a very good summary of research, uh, this was uh, a statement. I'm gonna read when I stop, say the next word. Indeed, one of the most enduring findings in reading research is the extent to which, to which students' vocabulary knowledge relates to their reading comprehension. Is this not true? It's true for you. It is true for your first graders. It's true for your fifth graders. It's true for your eighth graders. Uh, that their vocabulary is highly related to their reading comprehension. So what should we do at our site to improve vocabulary? Number one, in a class that you have, you as the teacher, for some child in that class, you are the highest example of oral language usage. Your own children got the benefit of you uh, with your college degrees, with your master's degrees, with all the books you've read, and thus the language that you were able to utilize. Some of our children don't have that benefit, but they have you. So we need to use the highest quality of language in our class. So one day I was in a class, it was a primary class, and the teacher said to the children, we are going to assemble. We are going to gather on the rug. 
for many days, she used the word assemble. And so that the students are hearing it, it's added to their lexicon, and they might even start using it. But we've got to give them the gift of our language. And we also have to consistently utilize uh, academic vocabulary. So I just taught recently online a lesson on transforming uh, decimals into fractions. Okay? Uh, and uh, so I had to be careful that I didn't say the top number and the bottom number, that I did indicate that, but utilize the words numerator and denominator so that the students had that academic language. And uh, in the primary grades, one way students gain vocabulary uh, is through their reading, narrative, and informative read-alouds. I would suggest that at least 50%, at least 50% of the read-alouds in the primary grades should be informational text uh, so that they would have bodies of vocabulary that they would be able to take into their studies in social studies, in science, and in health. And uh, outside of school, I would have kids be reading and reading and reading and reading and reading some more. In school, they need the time with the teacher because we're right there. They have an expert available to them. But outside, they could be reading a great deal. And we do know that they're going to gain vocabulary from that. And we could teach them word learning strategies. Now, my favorite simple one is inside, outside, inside, outside. You're reading along and you don't know the meaning of the word. You don't know the meaning of the word. And first you look inside the word. Is there a prefix? Is there a suffix that you're familiar with? Is there a root word you're familiar with? Does it give you any hints about the meaning of the word inside the word? Then you look outside the word. Uh, so you look at the context clues. And did the sentence itself give you hints? Did the surrounding sentences give you hints? And then you might have to utilize an outside resource. Now, many people argue that we don't really have to teach specific vocabulary, just teach them word learning strategies. And I have to tell you, there's excellent research to show the benefits of teaching words. Sometimes the context clues are not enough to get an accurate view of the word. But also, when you figure out the word, you get just one exposure to the word if you use the word learning strategies. But if I teach you vocabulary, particularly critical vocabulary for a passage, I can give you many exposures to it and engage you in doing many things with the word and thus increase the probability it moves from working memory to permanent memory. So we are gonna teach vocabulary. And it's definitely um, in research, direct vocabulary instruction has an impressive track record of improving students' background knowledge and comprehension of academic content. So as we teach vocabulary, uh, it improves comprehension. And when we work on comprehension, it also works on vocabulary. And Hattie and John Hattie's work looking at vocabulary programs found a very high effect size where 0.4 uh, and above up to one is the zone of desired effects. And it's definitely a desired effect. So let's teach vocabulary. Let's teach learning um, strategies for vocabulary, but let's also expressly teach vocabulary. So what should we be doing in terms of vocabulary instruction? In the same book uh, that I um, told you about, uh, by, that is edited by uh, David Kilpatrick, uh, the chapter by Isabel Beck and Margaret McCohen says, vocabulary, have deliberate word selection. English has more than a million words. It's a challenge. We have to hone in on the most critical words to teach. So we ask ourselves, what words in this passage you must you understand to get the gist? Uh, what words are critical to teach? And they should be ones that are useful in this moment, useful in the future. Uh, they should be words that uh, are unknown 
and maybe have some other attribute that could generalize, a prefix, a suffix, a root word, uh, or maybe it's a family of words uh, so the students could generalize. So we gotta be selective. And the biggest idea is, let's say the story uh, or the article has 20 words you think your kids don't know. You cannot teach 20 words in one session because you'd have to give it such light touch that they wouldn't be retained. So you need to get it down to three to five words in a session so the kids don't experience cognitive overload. So one of the most important things is deliberate word selection. And you're going to carefully give them the meaning of the word. Uh, and you are also going to have activities where they have to think about the word and actually have to use the vocabulary terms. So in that same book, uh, that chapter, uh, these are the three big guidelines that they gave us for our work in terms of vocabulary instruction. So when uh, Charles Hughes and I were writing the book on explicit instruction, one thing we did is reviewed uh, chapters, books, as well as articles written on the teaching of vocabulary and from it extrapolated this vocabulary and structural routine. And it is useful if I'm teaching vocabulary in kindergarten, uh, in fifth grade, eighth grade, and beyond, where we first ensure the student understands the pronunciation of the word. This appears to be more important than we thought about it. Because if I cannot pronounce the word accurately, I can't apply meaning to it, store it, and subsequently retrieve it. So pronunciation is necessary. And then we're going to give them the word meaning. Remember that was one of the elements uh, pointed out by Margaret McEwen and Isabel Beck as critical to vocabulary instruction, if it's gonna be effective. I'm gonna give them a meaning to understand. Then I'm going to illustrate it with some examples. In some cases, uh, I might even include and just oppose it to non-examples. And then I'm going to ask questions to check their understanding. So, you know, it's so helpful for, for us to have instructional routines to guide our teaching. Because you can say to yourself, oh, I've got to teach this word. That means that I have to ensure the pronunciation, the meaning. I have to give examples and I have to check understanding. It makes it so that our pace of our lessons uh, are uh, quick, that the students understand what's happening, we understand what's happening. So I celebrate all the time instructional routines such as this. Well, let's look at an example. Um, so when I was reading the story uh, in preparation, uh, there were a number of words that the students needed to know that were critical to understanding. And one of them was pester. Now, I know many children in the second grade have pestered someone, uh, but I wanted to be certain that they understood the word and also the relatives of the word. So first step, do they understand the pronunciation? So just to keep us all awake and alive, would you go down to the word this and we'll teach this together. So wherever you are, talk out loud, ignore your family and the dog, uh, and begin. This word is pester. What word? And the students say pester. Continue. Tap and say the parts of the word. So put your hand on your table or on your lap uh, and tap as we say the parts. Pester. Again, pester. Pester is a verb, an action word. Now, notice that I had you tap out the word. And that came uh, from a study that was done by Lene Airy that found that oral segmenting of the word increased the probability, even in the upper grades, that you would have an accurate pronunciation. And thus you could attach meaning to it, store it, uh, and retrieve it. Now there is one more thing uh, in some of the more recent studies uh, that were done by Lene Airy, a premier researcher, uh, is that it also helps to do this. Look at the word pester and everybody spell it with me, P-E-S-T-E-R, so that the students would also spell the word uh, so that they would look carefully at the letters 
and say the names of those letters. So we're ensuring the pronunciation. And next step, I'm going to give the meaning and many of your younger grades, what we would do is what would be recommended by Isabel Beck, use a student-friendly explanation. So again, teach it with me, go down here and begin. When you ask for something again and again and again, you pester the other person. So if I ask for something again and again and again, I pester. Some synonyms, as if pester is annoy, nag, bother. Another one is beg, all right? So we're going to, oh, I can't wait to read the story and find out who pesters, why they pester, because this is a critical word for that passage. Well, after we introduce the meaning, that's not enough. We have to give some examples and they could be concrete like an object or you could act something out. It could be a visible image um, that you're using for an example. It could be just a verbal statement that you're going to use. Now, in our beautiful era uh, of having computers uh, where you could Google something, find images, and then drag that image into a PowerPoint, visuals work very, very well. And so that's exactly what I did when I taught it. So I wanna give examples of the word pester. So be my students. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to read it and then we'll reread it together. Jay wants a piece of candy. He will pester his sister until he gets what he wants. Pester. Okay, reading it with me. Jay wants a piece of candy. He will pester his sister until he gets what he wants. Here's another pester example. Felicia wants a new game. She begs, she nags, she pesters her mom in hopes of getting the game. So uh, I'm certain we have many, many parents uh, on this webinar, many, many parents who've spent the last three months with their children homeschooled. Uh, and they have suffered through a little bit of pestering. So we introduce the pronunciation, we introduce the meaning, we give examples, uh, and then we ask questions to check their understanding. Uh, so in their work, Isabel Beck and Margaret McCohen talk about deep processing questions. So the day I taught it, I asked, why might a child pester a parent? Why might they pester a parent? I gave them, it was in a classroom with real children, and so I had them think about it. And then I said, ones, tell your partner an answer, but you're going to start by saying, a child might pester a parent because. Now, this seems like a small thing, but it's not. Because I'm giving them a sentence starter so that when they give an answer to their partner or when I call on them, that they will use the word pester. For example, if I didn't give them a sentence starter and I said, why might a child pester a parent? And then I had them say an answer to a partner and then I called on a student and they said, well, um, you, know, like, you know, like to get a toy. The answer is a good answer but they did not use the word pester. So in the schools I work with, we are constantly giving children sentence starters so that they will use the academic language. Well, we could also uh, check their understanding by having them discern examples and non-examples. So be my students. You're going to tell me pester or not pester. At the grocery store, Matt begs and begs and begs for a donut. Is that pester or not pester? It is pester. Now, I could have asked it as a yes or no question. I could have said at the grocery store, uh, Matt begs and begs and begs for a donut. Is that pester? And they might say yes, but they didn't pronounce the word pester. I want them to use that word 
as much as possible. So I've rewritten the questions from yes or no to pester and not pester. Little like, things like this make a difference in the quality of our instruction. Well, um, this is another one that I'm really pushing because uh, when I was reading the work of Marzano and looking at comprehension, one thing really stuck out and that was the utility of asking compare and contrast questions so that we got higher order thinking. And so uh, we could have them compare two characters in the story. We could have them compare uh, two settings of a story. We could have them compare. And so constantly we can have kids compare and contrast. Well, now I'm using it in vocabulary. So be my students again. Last week, we learned the word request. One, think how request and pester are similar. Twos, think how request and pester are different. I give them a chance to think. I have them tell their answers to their partner. First, how they are similar, then how they are different. And then I might call on a partnership and have them stand up. Uh, I'm often having partners stand up together because little kids are so anxious to give an answer in front of class. But when they have a partner right there who could help them, uh, their anxiety goes down. But you really have to think, request I ask for something, uh, and pester I ask for something, uh, request I ask for something, often in a very civil way, and pester I ask it when I am kind of like a pest, I ask for it again and again and again. The students did a beautiful job on that. So we have an instructional routine that we can use for vocabulary. Another thing we can do and should do is when the word that we are teaching uh, is in a group of words, uh, then uh, we should introduce the relatives. Pester, pestered, pestering, pest. What else do we need to do here? We've taught the pronunciation of words so they can decode. Uh, we have taught the meaning but we also need to give them adequate background knowledge. You know, I read this story and I said to myself, let's think of children in Pennsylvania. Is it possible that they may not know uh, about the states of South Dakota and North Dakota? Is it possible that in second grade, that they do not have much idea about Native American tribes living uh, in the 1800s? Is it possible that they might not know buffalo and bison? So if I am teaching, uh, I am certainly going to give them some background knowledge. Uh, and uh, we know that children will have better comprehension if they have general world knowledge, they know what Asia is, South America. Uh, they know where Europe is, that they have domain-specific knowledge, and that they have broad knowledge in many domains. That's you. You have broad knowledge in many domains. Thus, you have better comprehension. Uh, and so we know that your background knowledge uh, is going to make a difference in terms of comprehension. And that's true for us as adults. Uh, I always uh, tell this story because I've thought about it a good deal. If you came to Portland, Oregon to visit, uh, and it's a beautiful state, just like your state, uh, and you were in Portland, Oregon, and said, Anita, what should I do? Well, I would say, one, you need to go to our coast because the Oregon coast is fantastic. Um, beautiful uh, and different than East Coast uh, coastline. And then I'd say, you better go to Powell's Bookstore, for we have the largest independent bookstore in the United States. Uh, and it's so big, blocks long, that you get a map as you go in, and all the rooms are different colors, and the map takes you to uh, different rooms. So my favorite is the Rose Room. And the Rose Room is children's literature, uh, the Rose Room uh, is uh, education, 
Uh, it happens to be comparative religion. It happens to also have history, poetry, and just so many things I adore. So I go to the Rose Room. Now, any book there that I take out because of my background knowledge, I have very high comprehension of. But I always envision that somewhere in the basement is a very gray room with a sign that says electronics. If I went and picked out one of those books, I can guarantee you I would have poor comprehension. Yes, I probably wouldn't know the pronunciation of some of the words, and I wouldn't know the meanings of many of the words, and I have no background knowledge. So background knowledge is quite significant. Uh, and I'm just gonna read this because it's an excellent summary of what we know about background knowledge. Across grades and reading ability, prior knowledge of subject area and key vocabulary results in higher scores on reading comprehension measures. The more background knowledge I have, the more vocabulary, uh, the more likely I am to do well on something measuring my comprehension where I read a passage and questions are asked. So what do you need to do at your site? Well, you need uh, to have informational text read in the primary grades, both to build up vocabulary and also to build up background knowledge. Uh, one of the best authors in this area is Susan Newman, uh, who uh, wrote a book all about words, uh, where she talks about uh, teaching uh, read alouds, but having them on the same topic. So one day I visited a second grade that was doing a program she wrote called World of Words, W-O-W, -W, wow. Uh, and the students were uh, over a, a two week period learning about caves and they were doing it through the read alouds. And they had had a story uh, that included caves. So they started their vocabulary there. Then they had a predictable book that had caves. Then they had an informational text with caves and then another informational text with caves and another informational text with caves. And by the time they were done, they didn't just have background knowledge on caves, but they had what she calls a knowledge network. So we could be very intentional about teaching background knowledge to students. And we could teach science and social studies and health uh, so that students have bodies of knowledge. Perhaps you've already read the book, The Knowledge Gap uh, by uh, Natalie uh, Wexler. Natalie Wexler. And uh, her argument is that we focus so much on comprehension strategies that we forgot to teach kids bodies of knowledge and that's interfering with their comprehension. Well, we can also again uh, really uh, promote outside of school as much wide independent reading as possible so students gain more background knowledge uh, and we can basically teach background knowledge for a passage. Now, I was asked earlier today, well, shouldn't children just do cold reads? Just, just you know, when they get tested, they have to do a cold read. They just have to uh, read it with no pre-teaching. Well, there's a difference between teaching uh, and testing. Yes, on the state test, they have to read articles for which the teacher's not gonna say, let me uh, teach the difficult to read words and the vocabulary and the passage. They have to read it cold and they have to answer it but we need to be kinder when we teach. Our job is to give the kids success, to set them up for success, and to teach them. Teach them how to read the words, teach them vocabulary, teach them background knowledge. Cold reads are appropriate for testing and uh, having augmented reading uh, with background knowledge is extraordinarily acceptable. So, I taught a little background knowledge. And again, you're going to be my um, students and I'm gonna pretend I'm teaching you remotely. Uh, and so uh, when we do remote, um, there are some things I'll have students do. I'll actually have them touching the screen with their finger, uh, with a pin. 
This is my pointer, which happens to be a chopstick that I got on a trip to Vietnam. And so I am touching the words. Uh, so we want to, uh, the most difficult part of remote teaching is uh, adding the right act of participation. All right, so uh, the first word in red is title. Uh, read the other two words to yourself, the other three words. Touch the words in the title and read them with me. Little Bear Lost. Now, before we read this story, uh, which uh, about Little Bear Lost, we don't know yet who Little Bear is and what led to him getting lost, but we're interested. But we need some background knowledge. Uh, and so, first, this story, put your finger on the first black word. That word is fiction. Uh, and we know that that is a story that someone has written. Now they used a lot of information about a Native American tribe to write the story, but it still is fiction. And we have characters in our story and uh, one group of characters, uh, and put your finger under the word Lakota. Say it with me, Lakota. Say it again, Lakota. They are a Native American tribe. So we're going to be looking at Little Bear, who's a member of the Lakota tribe. Uh, and we're also going to meet Blue Cloud, a member of the yes, Lakota tribe. And Little Bear, now we know, Blue Cloud's brother. So we're going to be introduced to the Lakota tribe and two members, Blue Cloud and Little Bear. Now, this is not a modern story. Nope, it's not like today. Uh, the life of this Native American tribe has changed over time, like all uh, civilizations change over time. This is set uh, in the early 1800s. And it was either written uh, to have the Lakota tribe in North Dakota or South Dakota. So we better learn something about those states. The author does not tell us this happened in North Dakota or South Dakota, but we know the Lakota tribe uh, was in those two states. So here is just a portion of an American map and put your finger on North Dakota. And above it is a line, uh, which is a uh, border between the United States and Canada. So North Dakota is right next to Canada. Now move your finger down below, and there we have South Dakota. So two states, North Dakota and South Dakota. Now let's look at it in terms of a map. There's the US map. All right, now I want you to go over to the East Coast and find PA for Pennsylvania and put your finger on it. Okay, so there we have our home state. And then if we go up to the top of the Canadian border, we have North Dakota, ND, South Dakota, SD. So put your finger on ND for North Dakota, SD for South Dakota. Excellent. All right, so right in the middle of our United States are those two states, but they, uh, North Dakota borders Canada. So that's where we found what tribe? The Lakota. Uh, we found two characters in the story, uh, Blue Cloud and, yes, Little Bear. So let's learn something about the Lakota tribe before we read the story. So first of all, they lived on a prairie. So the word up here in red, put your finger on it, is the word prairie. Say the word prairie. Excellent. Uh, and now I'll look at the same word in black. And let's look at the definition broken down into critical attributes. See that academic language? I would actually teach them what an attribute is. So uh, watch me read the first word 
first word is a compound word and the first part of it is land and then form. Remember when we figure out the meaning of a compound word, we go to the second word and ask, how does it relate to the first? A land form forms the land. So one way the land is formed is a prairie. Next attribute, a large open flat land. So a prairie is a large open flat land. Get your hands ready and do it with me. A large open flat land. Teacher taught. There's some research to show that adding gestures to words that we are teaching students increases their retail retail and the recall of the word. So having go large, open, flat land increases the probability they'll remember that as an attribute of a prairie. The next word, it's another compound word. So we read each word in it. The first word is grass. The next one is land, meaning it's a land that has grass and very few trees. So if you look at the picture, boy, what a perfect picture of a prairie. It is large, open, flat land, has lots of grass, no trees. Uh, and then I check their understanding. Uh, is this a prairie? Why and why not? Is this a prairie? Why and why not? And then we learned about the Lakota tribe. And so now here's one of the challenges if I was in a classroom, I'd have the students read this silently and then we could read it chorally together or I could have them read it to their partner. We have fewer options in terms of a remote lesson. For example, choral reading is very difficult if all of their audio is open, all the children's and the teachers because there's different transmission rates uh, across different um, platforms that you use. Getting, I mean, I was thinking on my birthday was during the pandemic and friends all over uh, got together and were singing to me, but I mean, it was not pretty because we could not get, they could not get their voices together. Uh, it was wonderful warmth from them, a wonderful greeting from them, but it didn't sound good. So what I have been doing is this, uh, is uh, I will have them uh, close off all of uh, hearing all of their uh, mates from class uh, so that doesn't interfere uh, and in many cases I will uh, have them uh, chorally read and I can't hear them either but I can watch their mouths to be certain that they are reading. Uh, if I uh, then I might call on one student uh, to read. Uh, I might have them read it silently, but I can observe them to see if they're actually reading it. And to be certain, I often will have them touch the words as they read, so of more intentionality, I can monitor it. So be my students and uh, put your finger on the word the, and move your finger as we read this together. The Lakota moved from place to place on the prairie. They were nomads. When you are a nomad, you move from place to place, usually for a reason. And continue, the Lakota tribe was nomadic. So look at the first word that's bold, and the word is nomads. When you move from place to place, usually for a good reason, uh, and you are called nomadic. Say it again, nomadic. So just because of our time, uh, and you have the idea of how we might teach it because they have to be actively involved. And so we introduced uh, buffalo and bison and the fact that they hunted them and that they used the meat for food, but also they used the skins for clothing and shoes as well as teepees. And that they had horses, which allowed them uh, to hunt buffalo. Uh, and uh, we also introduced their shelters, which could be taken down and moved because they were nomadic. Uh, and so they get an idea about their teepees. And they also needed to know what a cradleboard was because it was significant to the plot. 
So now there's two things that have happened here. Number one, the students have more background knowledge to read the passage. But also, you are curious. You want to read this story. You want to learn more about the Lakota tribe. So it has more than one purpose. Yes, background knowledge for comprehension, but also curiosity. And afterwards, I gave the students, they had the slides, they looked through them, they studied them, but we did what is called retrieval practice, where you have to take the information uh, in your mind and you had to bring it forward uh, and so that you had to then remember it. Retrieval practice is one of the most powerful uh, practices we could give children. So I said to them, I want you to think of some things that you learned about the Lakota tribe uh, as they lived in the 1800s. And then I had them stand up, face their partner, and I said, one, you're gonna go first and you're gonna say, here's some things I learned about the Lakota tribe in the 1800s. And we practiced that. So they had a way to get going on it. Uh, and then of course I'm moving around and monitoring. Uh, and then I said, twos, start with the sentence starter. Here's some things I learned about the Lakota tribe in the 1800s. Will they have better comprehension? Yes, absolutely. They've learned something too. Will we be able to do that when we do assessment? No, but when kids do poorly, we better ask the question, is it because they didn't have adequate background knowledge? Well, what else do we need to do? We have ensured that they can read the words, they know the meaning of the words, they have background knowledge, uh, and now uh, they have to hone in, they have to focus on the critical content. So basically what we know is that you have to have executive function, you have to have concentration, you have to have focus uh, for comprehension, whether it is comprehension of written language or oral language. So what might we do? Well, at a school, let's look at that again. Uh, number one, it appears useful uh, to embed and ask students questions on critical content when we read books to students. Uh, and remember, we're not just reading narrative, at least half of the books, if not more, are informational text. So when there's natural breaks in the material, then we're going to stop and we're going to ask questions of them uh, to be certain that they are comprehending, but also to clarify what is most important because we're not gonna just ask any question. We're gonna be very thoughtful about the questions and ask the most important understandings to that point. Well, we're also going to ask text dependent questions. So we'll get, this is such a, Pennsylvania thing. You've been working on text dependent questions for a number of years, uh, but there's a reason why we want to do that. And uh, we could teach children to generate questions so that we could stop or after they have read, they would have to generate questions uh, and answers on the material. There's some research that's su suggesting that we get, uh, particularly as students progress in the grades, that we even get higher growth in comprehension when they have to come up with really good questions and also record the answer. And we also uh, need to uh, teach students the text features that will support their comprehension. And this is uh, well verified through research. Narrative, basically the text structure, all of you know. It's called story grammar, the structure of a story. So they know that a story uh, has a name, that it has a title, it has a setting. Uh, and the setting often has significance, that they know that it has a main character. And that character often has a problem and then tries to resolve that problem and something happens in the end. So the teacher, the teacher teaches children the structure of a story which assists them in comprehension. Informational text, uh, text features such as 
headings, subheadings, graphics, that they learn uh, the significance and how to treat those text features. But also they know some basic organization that the paragraph has a topic followed by details that relate to that topic. That many informational texts you read have an introduction, as a body, as a conclusion, so that they know this. Even things like compare and contrast embedded in it or a sequence. What else do we need to be doing? Well, remember how I had them do retrieval practice, uh, where the students have to come up with information they've been taught uh, without any scaffolding? And so tell me everything you've learned about uh, the Dakota, uh, Lakota tribe. Uh, and so they have to give that information. Well, uh, we also can have them write in response to passages. There's a real a reciprocal nature here. Uh, if I comprehend uh, and then I have to write about it, that will strengthen my writing skills as well as comprehension. So let's look at some of those things. Asking questions, a evidence-based time-honored procedure. I added that because I had one day a beautiful young teacher come to me and say, well, you know, asking questions is so old school, so old school. You know, there are some things that are older that are really good uh, and uh, particularly may have a long history of research showing its utility. And asking questions uh, to guide and monitor students' comprehension during instruction uh, is a very, very good thing to do. And we have some idea of the kinds of questions that we should ask. And thus emerges text-dependent questions. Now, we used to tell you that there were three kinds of questions you should ask. That you should ask questions uh, that connect the uh, reader uh, to the text, which would be text-dependent questions. But also, we should ask questions that connect uh, the student uh, and the text. So it's connecting the text to uh, the children's experience and then asking questions that would uh, connect the text to the broader world. Oh, we used to just bang that into your head. We looked in uh, at a symposium taught 10 years ago, someone did a training on that. But <laughs> there is a concern about one of those, and that is asking questions designed to connect the text to the student. And you think, well, that would be a good thing to do. Well, the challenge is that it takes your cognition away from the text. And our job needs to be to keep all cognition in the text, not out of the text. Get ready to do this with me. In the text, not out of the text. And I always use this one experience because it was such a good illustration of what happens when children's thinking is removed from the text. So it occurred in New Jersey. I am watching a fifth grade class. We also videoed this, so I've been able to re-look at it. Uh, and the students are gonna be reading an adventure story about a family that has gone to Idaho for rapid kayaking adventures. So the students and the teachers start reading the introductory part of the story. And then the teacher stops and says, have any of you had a similar experience? I knew right away, I took out my yellow tablet to take notes because I knew that this was going to take them away from the content. So the first boy raises his hand uh, and uh, he says, we live at the lake outside of town uh, and we have kayaks. Yes, we do. We have kayaks. We have double kayaks. Uh, and we have two of them because you can't use motorized vehicles on the lake. So we go out in our kayaks. Next child raises his hand and said, I just live two houses down from him. Uh, and we too have kayaks, but we decided to get single kayaks, just one person in it paddling because we like to go side by side so we can talk. When you're at both ends of the kayak double, you can't really talk. 
uh, but also sometimes someone just wants to go upstream and leave. Uh, and so uh, we can do it if we have a single. And then the next girl raises her hand and says, you know, I live at the uh, lake also outside of town. But my family decided not to have kayaks. We have lots of guests, lots of people come to visit us. Uh, and so we decided to get canoes because you could have a guest sit in the middle of canoe and they don't have to paddle. On a kayak, they kind of have to paddle. Uh, and so the next child raises her hand and says, I don't live at the lake. My family lives at the shore. Uh, and we also have kayaks, but they're different than the ones pictured in the book. Ours are longer so they can handle the waves. The next child raises her hand and say, said, I've never been in a kayak. I've never been in a canoe, but last summer, uh, my grandparents took our whole family to New York City and we got on a big boat on the Hudson River and we went up the river. It was actually an architectural tour because uh, the person that was our guide was pointing, pointing out all of the uh, skyscrapers uh, in New York City. Well, as if to like wrap this up, the final child raised her hand and said, I've never been in a kayak, I've never been uh, in a canoe, I've never taken a boat trip up the Hudson, but in our house, if you came to our house in the living room, is an oil painting of a sailboat. Now there's not a teacher here that hasn't had this experience, but they're not thinking anymore about Idaho and Rapid River kayaking. Uh, their cognition has totally left it. Asking those questions where you are not focused on critical content is actually reducing comprehension. So once again with your hand, what we want is to keep you in the text, not out of the text. In the text, not out of the text. And what else do we know about questions? Well, this diagram from the work of Nancy Frey uh, and Doug Fisher uh, tells us something very important. I have many principals saying, I only want people to ask higher order questions. I only want them to ask higher order questions. However, uh, that would not be supported totally by research because just like your standard state, that oftentimes we should ask more literal questions so that the students have a foundation on which they could answer higher order. So I might have them read a section and ask general understanding questions, key detail questions, vocabulary, because with that knowledge, uh, they could determine the purpose of the author. They could determine the uh, inferences that could be made. Uh, they could have opinions that are based on the content, but they have to have a foundation. Uh, so uh, asking uh, general understanding, key detail, vocabulary questions is totally appropriate. Well, what else might we do? Uh, this is just to show you how I took that information and asked questions. I already determined at certain junctures where I was going to ask questions. So when we got to number one, I asked, why did Blue Cloud lose interest in her doll? And I had students think about it. I gave them a sentence st a starter. Blue Cloud lost interest in her doll because, and then had him share an answer with a partner, and then I called on a student. Then we read the next section, and I asked, so why was it so important that Lakota children learn silence? And then again, uh, I had them tell it to their partner. And so we could ask questions. And these are just example questions for you. We could also uh, teach children how to ask questions. For example, in stories, they could, after reading a certain amount, use story grammar to generate a question. And they could, if they were in second, third grade or above, they could record the question and they could record the answer. Just remember that we have many studies 
uh, a good friend of mine, Bob Dixon, did work on this area and found that the students' comprehension was really improved, particularly in intermediate grades, when they were taught to generate questions and record both the question and the answer. Well, this is just a reminder of the structure. Um, this is a story, so the structure would be story grammar. And I see you there, and we're almost there. Uh, and so these are the kind of questions we could ask about the setting, the main character, the problem, uh, the theme uh, within the story. And they could retell the story utilizing story grammar. Now I just want to uh, give you one more point, and that is having students write in response to what they've read. Uh, and so they could write a summary, but they might need scaffolding, scaffolding to lift them up. And one is a writing, some uh, writing frame. Now you're gonna receive a PowerPoint. So you will have this as a slide because I've asked them to give you the PowerPoints so that the students copy it uh, and then they add to it. Uh, so the day I taught this, uh, the title of the story was Little Bear Lost. The setting of the story was a Lakota village in North Dakota in the 1800s, so that they are then practicing their story grammar, but also writing uh, a summary. We could also have the students expand on a sentence. I highly recommend the book written by Judith Hockman and Natalie Wexer. Yes, Natalie Wexer was the author also of Knowledge Gap, uh, but they're a very systematic book uh, on going from the sentence to the paragraph to the essay very systematically, uh, but they really emphasize that children should write in response to what they've read, so they have some ideas to write. So here they're given a sentence and three words, when, where, and why. They have to figure out how they're going to add those, so they write down when it happened, where it happened, why, and then put it all together. So we did want to give some minutes at the end and we still have four large minutes. So uh, Jeannie, uh, would you, uh, just I want to remind you at the very end, I re-put uh, the little um, checklist so that you could take those slides and I really do think they'd be useful for you as a teacher to look at, as a group of teachers teaching like fourth grade or third grade or second grade or the school. Uh, so check out the checklist and use them. So Jeannie, what kinds of questions emerged? Okay, Anita, we have a couple of questions. One was from Pam and she wanted to know, how do you suggest doing a read aloud? Is it something that only the teacher is reading? Well, by definition, a read aloud is I am reading it to you. So I wonder if she's contrasting that with a shared reading experience, maybe? So you might, well, a, a read aloud is one where I am going to prepare you for reading it. I'm going to read a part. I'm going to stop. Uh, we are going, then I'm going to ask questions on it and uh, we might have a discussion of it. So, uh, you know, many teachers would say to me in kindergarten that they should read the book all the way through. And you might choose to do that. But if we wanted to work on it in terms of comprehension, we would do as I did with that passage, broke it into natural sections and would stop and ask questions on it. So read alouds, and you might want to watch on uh, the videos. We have two on read alouds on www.explicitinstruction.org. Thank you. I think um, we'll just take one more due to the okay. time. And I know that this session was more specific to instruction that will yield an outcome of comprehension. Mm -hmm. um, but there are people asking questions about suggestions for progress monitoring comprehension. Um, I know that comprehension assessment is a tricky beast, <laughs> um, but if you could comment on that, that would be great. So comprehension assessment uh, is a tricky beast. Uh, and uh, basically, if you look at the research studies on comprehension, they usually had the students read a passage and they asked questions on it. Uh, and then they used their accuracy on those questions as an indicator of their comprehension. 
but let's say the students have very poor comprehension. Now you have a bigger question to ask, like why? Uh, is it because they can't read the words? Is it because their vocabulary uh, did not match the vocabulary of the passage? Uh, is it because they don't have background knowledge? Or is it because they weren't concentrating uh, as they were doing it? So I find it a very difficult way to tap into, but we would measure it in terms of formative assessment by here is a paragraph uh, and uh, you're going to read it. Now, here's what many core programs do is they have like a unit where they are uh, having kids read many things and from that they're learning vocabulary and background knowledge. Uh, and so when they go to assess, oftentimes uh, that would be in the same area of background knowledge and vocabulary. So two of the elements have been removed. Right. Uh, and then they're asking questions on it. Uh, and, uh, but if you can read the words and you have vocabulary and you have background knowledge uh, and you are focused on the critical content, uh, that will lead to the outcome of comprehension. Thank you, Dr. Archer. Thank you. We want to thank everyone for attending this session. It has been so enlightening. Um, we want you to remember that these sessions are being recorded and will be available later on the Patton YouTube channel uh, in the future sometime. The Patent Literacy team is also planning on creating some supports aligned to the presentations at the symposium to maximize the learning for families and educators. And I just have one more reminder for all of you before we go. In order to be eligible for the Act 48, you must attend the keynote session, attend one concurrent session per time slot, submit the attendance and Act 48 request in the Schoology folder for each day. And today it's the little green folder at the bottom of the screen. And this must be completed by midnight, Friday, June 19th. So again, thank you, Dr. Archer. Our next, thank you. Our next session starts at 2.45. And almost there. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Have a great rest of your day. Enjoy this great symposium. <laughs>